Thank you so much for joining us for Beyond the Nest series, IEPs. I want to introduce our panel. We have Matt Cohen, who's an attorney for an advocate for children with disabilities. And Brett Cooper is one of our parents who has a child with an IEP. Tamia is our Merlin um, director. And I think that's it. Unfortunately, we had a, um, our IEP advocate and they were unable to make it today due to an emergency, a family personal thing. So we are in good hands with our panel. And if you guys wanna say a little bit, Matt, if you wanna start, introduce sure. yourself. Sure, I'm Matt Cohen. I'm an attorney in Chicago and I have a law firm that focuses on representation of kids and adults with disabilities, including at IEP meetings, at 504 meetings, with uh, conflicts that develop with schools, and including in mediation and hearings in court. And we have been very busy in these last couple of years with all of the increased uh, difficulty that kids have been having due to the pandemic. And so we've actually been adding staff and bringing on additional services. And I also have uh, a child with a disability myself who's now uh, an adult, but certainly have gone through what many parents have gone through and relate to, to people's experiences at that level. Can't hear you, Evie. Tamia, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I hope you can hear me. I got earbuds in. Yeah, you're not in. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Tamia West. I am um, celebrating my one year anniversary with IS Landing as of yesterday. So I'm one year old. <laughs> Um, I come from Chicago Public Schools. I've managed in their special education department for seven years. Prior to that, I was in Homewood, Baltimore, doing school social work and MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support, and um, also Prairie Hill School District uh, doing uh, school social work and PBIS, that is positive behavior interventions and supports um, as the um, internal coach. And now I am here at IS Landing um, uh, with the Merlin program, doing a lot of work is, uh, with Merlin Day Academy um, and just building up our program um, to be even more effective than what it is currently. Thank you. And last but not least, Britt Cooper Robinson. Hi, I'm Britt um, and I am a parent to two kiddos. Cooper is turning nine in about a week and a half, I know. And uh, August who is almost six. Cooper has an IEP and uh, began with IOS Landing when he was two, went all the way through Bluebird and through kindergarten and actually um, August who currently does not have an IEP, but he also received services at IOS when he was really small, OT and um, speech and food therapy. So um, yeah, very grateful to give my perspective as the parent navigating these complex systems. Well, we appreciate all of you joining us and I'll give the panel the floor. Well, I'm a little bit unclear if you you want us to just respond to the questions that were sent out and in that order or, or kind of what you have in mind, so. I was about to say the same thing. Evie, you're, you're um, muted. I think I'd be better at this, sorry. Um, yes, let's start with the questions that people, um, that our families sent in. That's a okay. great start, thank you. Okay, so I think I'm um, first up. Um, and some of these questions I see they do overlap, but the first question um, a parent had was, what are the benefits of an IEP in general? specifically for children with high-functioning autism. 
um, the benefits of an IEP. Well, I always tell parents that if you have a child with a disability, be it a medical diagnosis or a clinical diagnosis, so say um, there is um, oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD combined type, meaning it is both attention deficit and hyper um, activity, um, or you have a child that you may suspect something is wrong and you're not entirely sure, then you should pursue a full initial evaluation so you can see if your child is eligible for an IEP. And I always begin that way because um, there are uh, 13 disability categories that are acknowledged by Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And it's important to make sure that you seek a full initial evaluation so that the team who is designated to complete the evaluation can give you um, the right Right disability category. And if they do not, um, you know, I always say an IEP is a fluid process, so it can be updated. And also to pursue, pursue a free and appropriate public education. So if you are a parent and you have a child who attends a parochial school or a private school, it is still the responsibility of your local education agency to provide you with um, special education services. So an evaluation, an IEP, um, and high function and autism. Um, absolutely. You want to be able to um, make sure that you're getting the right educational services and related services. And what I mean by related services, the services that BBD and IS Landon provide occupational therapy, physical therapy, social work. In a school setting, those are considered related services. And those services are provided to children to make sure they are able to access the learning environment. Um, so thinking about it from a continuum, be it general education classroom to um, uh, special education classrooms to an integrated se setting, whatever the learning environment is for that child, they're able to um, access the curriculum with related services. The second question is, what suggestions do you have for getting an IEP when your child has sensory processing disorder, but not autism? Um, and it's going to be five. Uh, and let's see something else to this question. And there are some social emotional concerns as well. So if your child is about to turn five and maybe receiving early intervention services or not, depending on where you are, because some parents may not be um, in the Chicago area, but may be in the Chicago land area, so the suburbs, you want to um, follow up with your school district. So if it's Chicago Public Schools, it is called Citywide Assessment Team that provides the evaluative uh, services. And if you're a parent and you're in um, the suburbs, most suburbs call it pre-K roundup. And that means that children who are about to turn five can come to their school district um, to uh, receive a screening or an assessment to determine what the services are. And if there is a delay, um, then they may qualify under develop, um, DD developmental delay, but that is one disability category that does age out. So when the child is about to turn nine, then um, the IEP team would consider look, you know, they will have to look at another disability category. So the suggestion I have for you is if you have a concern um, about your child, developmental delay covers social, the social emotional domain, um, pursue an IEP. It, it doesn't hurt. I always encourage parents to do it so that they can have that protection, that they are able to receive um, the support they need in order to meet their child's um, education. Um, that is their right, so definitely pursue it. And the last question that I have, um, how do you know when to pursue an IEP if you currently have a 504 plan? Um, a 504 plan um, mainly focuses on accommodations and modifications. So they're testing um, if your child has concerns with accessing the curriculum, um, just being able to take notes, any of those things that impact your, your daily living, um, then that's a 504 plan. But 
I always encourage parents to pursue an IEP if you feel like there's more to it than accommodations and modifications. Um, also with the 504 plan, and sometimes parents don't know this, you can still get related services under a 504 plan. So you can still get school social work services. You can still have access to nursing services. Those would be considered accommodations under a 504 plan. But if you have concerns with the curriculum and you want um, to get that specialized instruction, then definitely pursue an, um, an IEP. Uh, I uh, tell parents that an IEP covers more than a 504 plan, um, so it doesn't hurt. And you, you get access to more resources, in my opinion, um, with the IEP versus a 504, if you think um, it's more to it than accommodations and modifications. And I think, Matt, it is your turn. Great. So let me, I would just, uh, to me, uh, echo and expand on what you said about 504 for a second. The part of what's the difference between a 504 plan and an IEP is that it's easier to get a 504 plan than it is to get an IEP. And part of the reason for that, it, in fact, I think you could, if you imagined the universe of kids who qualify for an IEP, any kid who qualifies for an IEP would also meet the criteria for a 504 plan, but not the other way around. Some of the kids who qualify for a 504 plan don't qualify for an IEP. And sometimes uh, you can actually get schools to do a lot of the things under an IEP under a 504 plan as well. But one of the reasons schools are more likely to think about an IEP as soon as you start talking about more services is that the state reimburses them for a lot of the services under an IEP, whereas they don't reimburse them for any of the services under a 504 plan. And so that's why I think accommodations are seen as the primary focus of a 504 plan. But I agree with you, Tamia, it certainly can include all sorts of therapies also. Uh, but the more services that you get, the more money that's attached to the things that are gonna have to be done under a 504 plan, the more likely it is for a school to think about well, maybe we should do an IEP. But the, the big thing that an IEP does that a 504 plan doesn't typically do is it has goals and objectives and it has a specific plan for when and how the goals and services are to be carried out. And so to me, a big advantage of the 504 plan is that it's easier to get and it's more flexible. And I would even say it's probably less stigmatizing than having an IEP because you don't have to have a specific label as having one type of disability or another. Uh, the big advantage of an IEP is that there's much more detail about what's going to be done. And as parents, you're going to get more information and have more that you can use to hold the school accountable and to see how your child's doing. Uh, are they making progress on all those goals and objectives or not? And so the IEP actually, in my mind, is a very a uh, well-designed idea, and pardon the, the pun it with the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, but the notion behind an IEP is kind of like what companies do when they adopt a strategic plan. It's saying we think about what we want the kid to be doing over the course of the year and even longer than a year, and then we're going to figure out what are the steps that they're going to need to work on in order to get to that outcome. And so that's a very thoughtful process, or at least it's supposed to be, and parents also have a right to participate in that process. Uh, so, so then you try to build in goals. And if it's not working, then you have information to go back to the school and say, hey, this isn't working. We're concerned about either it's not being implemented or maybe it's not enough. And that's sometimes where having an advocate or an attorney becomes uh, important because uh, the school isn't always going to agree with you about what's needed. And sometimes whether they agree with you or not, they're just perceived they don't have the time or money or whatever else. And so you end up in a situation where the child's not getting things that they need and, and you have a right to uh, ask for a meeting, whether it's a 504 meeting or an IEP meeting to discuss that. And if you can't work it out, then you have a right to uh, request something called mediation or something called a due process hearing to challenge that. Uh, under the special ed law, under 
There's no right to mediation with a 504 plan, but there is a right to a hearing under 504 plan. And oftentimes, and to me, I don't know if when you were in the schools this happened, but sometimes schools will even be willing to use mediation to work out 504 problems. Mediation is a very good method to try to get people to sit at the table when they're not able to work things out at the IEP level and try to come to a compromise about what the kids can do. So that, that's a fairly long-winded, actually, addition to what you said, but I, I just wanted to throw that in also. Uh, there is a question that I had um, that uh, <clears throat> had to do with whether a child can be disciplined uh, for behavior that is caused by their disability under a 504 plan. And I'm actually gonna expand that to, to be not just under a 504 plan, but under an IEP. And, and the, this is something that I sometimes do uh, three hour or even a full day seminars on. So this is a, a very condensed version of a very complicated subject. But uh, the short answer is that the schools are supposed to identify anything about a child's disability that might cause or, or create uh, emotional or behavioral problems, even if the child has a disability that isn't focused on uh, behavioral issues. So for example, a child might have an intellectual disability or learning disability or autism that's not primarily focused on problem behavior or, or difficult emotions. But if that's uh, arising as a consequence of the disability, the school's still supposed to identify that as a need and provide some response to it. If a child has a 504 plan, that might include, as to me already said, counseling services. You could do that under an IEP. It might include uh, something called a functional behavioral analysis and a behavior intervention plan. And again, you could do that under a 504 plan or an IEP. But the big thing that, that we're concerned about under both laws, but especially with an IEP rather than a 504 plan, it, maybe it's important to say that a, a 504 plan is to me a set is intended to accommodate, whereas a special ed IEP is intended to remediate. So those are different. And so if a child has something about their disability that's causing them to have behavioral problems or putting them at risk for a behavioral problem, there's probably more that you would typically be able to do to build in proactive strategies and, and teaching to help the child. But whether they're under a 504 plan or an IEP, I use the term that the parents should work with the school to create a behavioral umbrella, which means what are the things that can be done to identify what are the vulnerabilities of the child? What do they need to learn in order to develop appropriate behavior? And then how do we respond if they're having a problem with the behavior? What are the interventions that we're using to head off that behavior in the future or when it happens to bring them back on task and into the classroom so that they'll be able to return to appropriate behavior as quickly as possible? But the big thing is if the behavior that gets a kid into trouble leads the child to be subject to suspension or expulsion, uh, the school has a lot of discretion to exclude a kid for up to 10 school days. But after that, they're not allowed to put a child out of school for more than 10 days or to expel them if the behavior... Somebody's talking. Eva, if you could mute your phone, please, that'd be great. Um, thank you. Uh, if the behavior is leading the child to get into serious trouble, then the school is supposed to conduct something called a manifestation meeting in which they're supposed to figure out whether the child's behavior was a result of their disability or not. And if the answer is that it was a result of their disability, then they're supposed to figure out better or more interventions or different interventions to use to try to address the behavior rather than kicking the kid out of school. I'm not a fan of kicking kids out of school in any event because I don't think that typically helps very much, but there are protections for kids with disabilities that are different than the protections that are available for kids in regular ed. And then just to quickly address it, another question that was raised is, what can I do if my child's in a, uh, applying for a private school or is in a private school and the, the private school won't admit them because of a disability, or I'm gonna expand that to be where they're in a private school and they get into trouble because of their disability and the private school wants to exclude them. 
Uh, parents need to know that private schools generally are not covered by the IEP process. So what the IEP that a child has in a public school would generally not be applicable in a private school. A private school that is not religiously affiliated is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, and, and, and I guess I should say 504 plans also don't apply in private schools generally, but the Americans with Disabilities Act does, and at least if it's not a religious school, and that requires the school to provide reasonable accommodations and supports for the child unless there's either a safety issue or the nature of the child's disability would be that it would fundamentally alter the nature of the program that the private school is providing. So for example, if a private school was a French immersion school and the kid couldn't um, speak French without an interpreter, they wouldn't be required to provide an interpreter to interpret English uh, to French or French to English. Uh, they would only be required to provide reasonable accommodations or, or uh, supports to allow the child to be integrated if, if they're capable of learning French. Uh, so that, that would be an example. But it, it's, uh, I think just as a general matter, it's much harder to enforce these laws against private schools in comparison to public schools. So if you have a child with a disability, um, try to work things out with the public school before <clears throat> you look at going to the private school. Uh, there are circumstances where public schools may decide or be forced to pay for private schools if your child needs special services. So that's a different circumstance. But if you're just electing to go the private route for personal or religious reasons uh, and you have a child with a disability, that, that could be challenging. Um, this question's for Matt. Would you recommend starting the IEP process, initial assessment with an attorney or does an attorney usually join the process later on if things are not working? I think parents should avoid getting attorneys involved as much as possible. It's, uh, it's not a good way to maintain relationships and, and uh, uh, have collaboration. It's not that lawyers automatically prevent that. We often are able to de-escalate situations when they've gotten out of control. But at the start of a relationship with the school district, you should try to work things out and work collaboratively with them. And the, the only reason I would think about bringing a lawyer Sometimes I have families, for example, who come from a foreign country and they're just very confused about how the American process works. And so they want someone to help them. Or sometimes there's been some terrible trauma at school. And so they're just starting the IEP process, but already something bad has happened where they've lost trust in the school. But there are, there are lots of reasons to be concerned and to seek advocacy help or legal help. But I would try to make friends with the school and work together with the school as much as you can and, and either not get an attorney involved or if you have doubts about it, consult with the attorney privately, but wait to bring the attorney into the meetings until it's absolutely essential. Because as soon as lawyers come in for the parent and even advocates, the school's likely to lawyer up and, and that's generally uh, an impediment to having a cooperative relationship, not, a, not an aid to it. Totally makes sense. Now, how, um, one of the parents asked, how do you get started with an IEP? And maybe Britt, did you want to start with this? How did you get started? Sure. And that was one of my questions. Um, yeah, we, um, and we actually got started, had a hiccup and then got started again. Um, but for us, it started with research about where we lived and what zone we were in. And then, you know, on a very practical level, finding out just the, what was at that school? Did they have a full-time case manager? Did they have multiple case managers? Um, and I didn't necessarily have uh, natural relationships with other IEP parents at that school, but I, I went out and found those people, um, tapped into neighborhood resources so that I could get to meet those people and have really honest discussions. Um, and you know, I'm speaking for myself, but for the people that I talk to, um, the people that are kind of ahead of you on this path, I think are always willing to talk. Most of us wish we had had something like this or someone to hold our hand. Um, so don't be afraid, even if you don't know them, to say, hey, we're, we're coming in this year or next and we need to know what to do. Um, because ultimately, each school is different. And even within the very official and legal things, 
Um, for example, we, we realized the hard way that our case manager, who is phenomenal, she doesn't communicate well over email. You know, like she works better if you call her or if you show up at her office. Um, but I didn't know that ahead of time and, and kind of got lost in the process waiting to find out. So whatever you can find out ahead of time, um, you know, especially I, I so agree with what uh, Matt suggested. Um, public schools, uh, particularly in Chicago, are in so many ways best suited to provide uh, everything that should come with an IEP. But depending on your neighborhood, depending on your zone, it can be a, a wildly different uh, experience. For us, um, we started the process, uh, got, we had an outside psych eval because that's what Bluebird and IAS had recommended to us. And that was certainly something that was helpful to bring with us, but CPS will insist on doing their own evaluation. Um, they offered us an IEP, but at the time we were zoned for a school that was not willing to meet the requirements of the IEP. We could have gone uh, the lawyer advocate route and chose not to at that initial point. Then COVID happened and everything was sort of upside down for a while. Then we moved and found ourselves in a district where when I started doing all that kind of research and talking to people at the playground, I found out we were at a school that um, really prides itself on being an advocate for kids with heightened needs. So it felt like a better opportunity to pursue that again. Uh, we had our outside information. We had an updated psych eval. Um, but then the first person that I contacted was the case manager. Um, and she, once we worked out our communication, she guided us through the process and we were able to sort of get the right paperwork and evaluations in place. I think one of the biggest things to know is that even under the best and most efficient circumstances, an IEP takes time. Um, so for instance, with our kiddo, one thing that we really advocated for was that he be put in the inclusion or the blended classroom. We knew that even though they were starting the IEP process, basically from the very first day of school, that it could be as late as Thanksgiving, end of November, before legally those documents were binding and absolutely implemented. And we didn't want him, I mean, academically, we didn't want him to waste the better part of a semester. But for me as a parent, my big thing's always been, I want him to like learning. I want him to enjoy going to school. And so we knew that accommodations would need to start way before that paperwork and those evaluations were finalized. Um, that meant advocacy on our part, lots of communication with the teacher, um, we've been very fortunate that we have transparent and receptive teachers, but I do think that having him in the inclusion classroom made that difference because that's just like a, a muscle and a skill set that they're used to using. Um, so he was getting the support he needed well before the paperwork was finalized and those goals and, um, you know, all the individual things were like set in stone and legally binding. Um, so I think a lot of research about where you're at and what to expect. Um, we did end up, we never went so far as to get a lawyer, but we did get an education advocate. Um, but I so echo what Matt said. We showed up to one meeting with her and everybody like freaked out and froze up and got very defensive. Um, in hindsight, I would have had her work with us because I just found the system confusing. And then I wouldn't have brought her to that first meeting because we hadn't even had any conflict with the school yet. It was just a matter of me having a hand to hold as I was trying to navigate all the hoops to jump through. Um, and that would have de-escalated a lot of things that sort of didn't need to get uh, heightened in the first place. Um, but yeah, highly, highly recommend the outside input from your doctors and therapists and then combining that with the evaluations and wisdom and experience of the schools um, and keeping those channels of communication as open and as transparent as possible. That sounds great. Thank you. So Lisa has a question. Something? 
Oh, oh sure. go ahead, Evie. Oh, I want to no, add something no, to, yeah, I think it's what's important for parents to know is when you start the process of getting evaluated, um, your child is technically covered under IDEA um, through MTSS, so the uh, tier three level, which is intensive services. So even though the paperwork may not have been signed already and you're still going through the process, your child is technically covered as if they had an IEP that was finalized and in the works. So make sure you, you know that, um, and we share that with parents a, a lot because they think that just because they're going through the process and it takes, um, you have 60 school days to complete the process if you have 60 school days left in the school year, uh, because if the IEP, if the evaluation process starts, let's say it starts now, the school district is responsible for completing it before the school year ends. But it's important to know that you are covered um, while you know, you're know you going through that process of being evaluated and determining the IEP, what the goals and objectives and all of that will entail. Perfect, thanks Tamia. So um, I have another question from Lisa. What if a child doesn't flourish in a public school? Can you get any of those dollars transferred to a private institution? Well, Matt mm -hmm. can speak yeah. more to I was gonna say Matt can speak more to, to this one, but the only thing I would say is the placement decision has to be changed at the at the school. So the IEP team, you know, you have the data and it says, well. The public school, this setting is not going to work. Maybe don't, they don't have the reset resources or um, they don't have the human capital, so they don't have the people to implement the IEP um, and they have to make a placement um, change in the IEP. But Matt can go further into that one. Sure. So the overall, school districts are required to provide a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And the, the operative words are first the word appropriate, which doesn't mean the best, but which is uh, ambitious and uses good goals to allow the child to make a good amount of progress. And then the words least restrictive environment, which doesn't mean the child stays in regular ed or in the public school no matter what, but means generally you don't move to a more restrictive setting like a private program unless either the school has tried everything else and it hasn't worked. That would be a situation where the private program would be most likely to be considered. But sometimes, as Tamia is saying, there, there may be the child has a very severe emotional behavioral problem. They have a very unusual condition that requires some special skill or a special setting. It could be even a child who has autism or ADHD and they have a lot of trouble in a big building and they have trouble with a lot of noise and a lot of transition and distraction. And so they need a, a specialized environment to be able to just uh, stay regulated and get through the day. But public schools do sometimes, either at their own initiative or at parent request, suggest that kids be placed and, and agree to fund kids being placed in a private school. So that can happen. The other thing that can happen, and this is a bit more complicated and you definitely, I don't, I don't uh, try to, talk up talking to a lawyer or an advocate for many things, but parents do have a right to place their child in a private school at their own expense anytime that they want to. But if a parent really feels that the school is not doing the job and they're in an urgent situation and they found a private school that can provide the appropriate special ed services, there is a procedure called a unilateral placement where a parent can make the placement as long as they've given the school written notice 10 business days in advance that they're making the placement, that they're making it because they don't feel the public school can do the job and that they want the public school to pay for it, then they can go back to the public school and try to work out funding after the fact um, in order to get funding started, even though they've already started the child at that private school. The, the, there's a risk to that. And the risk is that the public school may not agree at that point or that the parent might have to get into a legal fight in order to prove that the private school is needed. So it's not automatically guaranteed just because you sent this letter, but there is a mechanism other than through the normal IEP process where parents can pursue that private placement and get funding for it. Great, thanks Matt. 
<clears throat> um, this is probably for you and Tamia. Um, Daniel asked his 10 year old daughter has a 504 plan for ADHD. However, her grades are not improving and she has fallen behind. Is this an appropriate reason to ask for an IEP? I'm going to, well, you go, you want me to go first, Matt? I'll take it. Um, oh, go ahead. Well, no, you do it. You've got something in mind. Go ahead. I, I'm only going to say this. Um, when I was at CPS, our uh, law department, um, um, Louise Rodriguez, who was the head of the law department at the time, shared with us that we can't um, say that a child doesn't need an a, a IEP if they're making, you know, they're making little progress. But when you look at the um, the grade band for um, the child, if they're not on grade level, but they're making progress within the grade level, that's not enough to say they don't need an IEP. But we should at least um, come to the table, have a domain meeting. Um, and a domain meeting basically means that every team member that's a part of the IEP team is present to say yes or no, they're going to domain in to evaluate the child. But it doesn't hurt to pursue that initial evaluation just to see you know, are we doing the right things here at the school? Do we do we have the right resources in place? Um, have we figured out the correct uh, instructional approach for the child? But we we were told that making little progress, but not enough progress to still be on grade level, um, is not enough to say we don't need to pursue an IEP. So I, Louise and I disagreed about a lot of things, but not everything. <laughs> and and what you just said. I agree with part of what you said because you're reporting on what Luis told you. I'm sure he did that, but I, I disagree with part of it. So, um, and, and this is a common area where there's sometimes disagreement, but the way I would look at it is a bit differently. Uh, number one, you don't have to, um, you cannot get an IEP. And I talked about this in my answer earlier, unless you need special education. So for a kid who has ADHD and is struggling, part of the thing you have to ask yourself is what is the special ed component and is that going to be necessary for the child to do better or not? I might ask myself the question before I fought for the IEP, is there a way to upgrade the 504 plan to give the student more support? And we may be able to accomplish what that student needs under the 504 plan and not deal with the IEP. On the other hand, you could get an IEP for a kid with ADHD who's on grade level already because they may need an IEP for social reasons. They may need an IEP because even though their grades are okay, they're not able to turn in their homework ever on time. And they need support in learning executive functioning skills that are gonna be taught by a special ed teacher in a resource room one period a day. And so they don't need to be in a special ed class for the academic instruction but they do need to have somebody actually teaching them that executive functioning skill. So it, it's, um, it, I have kids who have been uh, at the top of their class grade wise, but they have major social problems or they have major organizational problems or they have behavior problems. There are lots of reasons that a kid can qualify for an IEP other than that they're not at grade level. So it's not just a question of grade level or not grade level. It's really, is there an instructional need that requires an IEP that's affecting some part of how they're functioning at school and, and, and that they need some form of instruction to help to remedy that. Uh, but, but I wouldn't say it's an all yes or an all no. Uh, and in fact- uh, So Matt, how would you know? How would, how would a parent be able to answer that last question, which is very pertinent, what you just said. Um, yeah. If you need the, the, the instruction, how would a parent know that? Frankly, what, a, what lot of parents, would they pursue? A, a lot of parents don't know it. And even a lot of educators aren't aware of that. And some private clinicians aren't aware of it. So because we're talking about a fairly high level of understanding about how do you package uh, services to respond to particular needs. But executive functioning is something, something where oftentimes you might need to talk to a mental health professional and they would have to have knowledge and get data about the ways that that is a deficit that's interfering with the child's performance at school. You could have, I, I think there was a question about anxiety. You could have a child with anxiety who is academically okay, but they're 
not going to class because they're anxious or they're not coming to school because they're anxious. That would be another example where there might not be a grade level problem, but there's a performance problem because of the nature of the disability and they might still qualify for the IEP. So, but you're right, it, it's, it's oftentimes perplexing for parents and for teams to figure out what do we identify as the instructional component. And that's why I said, sometimes the answer is an enhanced 504 plan rather than an IEP because they need more accommodation or social work support, but they don't need an instructional element. Perfect. So um, Yuzar has a question. Do we initiate IEP to be reevaluated re every year? They initially received one, but they opted out for Bluebird Day. So when they want to go back, do they need to be reevaluated? Re if, it's, if it's been more than three years. Oh, sorry, um, three years. Yeah, yeah that's actually... Initial. Oh, sorry, Tara. That's very similar to what happened to us. We thought we were going to leave Bluebird. And so we went ahead and started the process. They offered him an IEP. And then because of other behavioral problems, we decided to stay back and do kindergarten with Bluebird. Um, and then Again, like for us, there was COVID and a private school and a couple of other things. So it was even more than the one year before we went back. But um, to your point, it was within the three years. And so um, what we did was when we contacted the case manager, we said, hey, he, yes, it's your records are right. He's never been enrolled in CPS. But if you do a records pull, you will see that he was, a, you know, we, and like, we didn't even know the exact date. We kind of knew the month and the year, you know, he was offered an IEP and that was actually in, in our situation, that was part of kind of what got the wheels turning even faster because they had a legal obligation to update it rather than just having two parents come in and say, Hey, we think we need, you know, we think we need this. Can we get the ball rolling? And, you know, them saying, well, we're not sure but it was, it was already on the books. Um, and we initially kind of got a very, um, I don't know, lukewarm response. Like, yeah, I don't know. But that was when our education advocate said, no, request a records pool, it will come up. And then they, they don't have a choice, they have to respond. Um, so that was very similar to our, to our circumstances as well. Thank you, Britt. So um, from Janelle, what's important to include in a, in a progress established IEP before unenrolling from the district to homeschool with the intent to return to district mid-year and outplace immediately upon return? I don't know if that does, does that make sense? Or Janelle, do you need to I don't want to answer that, that question. Okay. You that's, a, that's your personal question. I wouldn't even feel comfortable answering that. Okay. That, that's something that needs individual consultation. I don't, I don't think that's... Uh, um. Okay. I, sorry. Thanks. I mean, if, if Janelle can frame it in a more general way, but that's... we Lawyers, we talk about a compound question. There are multiple elements to that. And it's very personal. I, I think it's just better not to not to get into the detail of that. But if there's a more general question that she can frame, that'd be fine. Um, I guess I'm just trying to figure out generally, right? So since the pandemic and it's been two years, my son hasn't been in a physical outplacement um, school. The district has been home has been providing remote services for him. So the IEP has changed drastically from what it was when he was in therapeutic placement. And I'm just trying to, before the end of the year, redo the IEP and make sure that I've thought of everything that I need to think of so that when we do return to the district, we're able to get back to where we were, pre, you know, um, with the services in place that he would need versus having to go through everything in, in that manner. Well, I, again, I, I, not, I don't mean to sound negative, but you're, you're talking about something that someone could spend an hour talking with you about. 
and okay. to understand what your child needs. But what I would say at a minimum that might be helpful, what we do, and any parent could do this, if you have multiple IEPs and you're trying to assess progress and where the child's at and where do they need to be, sit down on your living room floor or at your dining room table and put those IEPs next to each other. That's and, what I've been doing. I've been comparing what we've had in the past to what we yeah, currently and, have and from the pandemic. Look, look at the, there are two ways to look at that that can be very helpful. Number one, there are reports that give you progress data and mm -hmm. look at the progress data and see whether it's going up at a reasonable level or staying flat or going down. And then also look at the goals because sometimes the goals are progressing appropriately and sometimes the goals are stagnating and the objectives are stagnating. So that can be a very big clue. If the goals are just being repeated year after year, that's a, a huge indicator that the child's not really making good progress. So those, those are kind of generic strategies that I would look at. Um, also could be, I, I couldn't tell exactly from what you said, but if your child's in school at the moment, you might think about having somebody come and observe to see what's happening from a, an outside perspective about uh, whether the programming appears to be on target for what they need and whether the, what's in the IEP is actually being delivered. Because that's the other concern is that sometimes IEPs are very well written, but they're not being appropriately implemented. And so you want to check out, is it really happening in the real world? Okay. Thank you. And Janelle, you know, we can discuss that more tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Don't well, worry, I, Matt. I, she's in good hands. <laughs> evaluation too. So it's like I was I was thinking through it and like looking at old IEPs, and then I was looking at like his uh, neuro evaluation and what the recommendations in there are. And so I I just have this like stack that's growing largely, and I'm like, well, what what part of this is actually important to address now versus later? But thank you, Tamia. Yeah, you're welcome. Laura has a question. My child is performing at minimum grade level at school, but due to her ASD, ADHD, and anxiety, but has the ability to perform well above grade level. I cannot get the school to discuss how to assist with focusing more and providing her with challenging work. What do you recommend on working with the school? I, I, I oh, go ahead. I may have asked a compound question here, sorry. <laughs> um, so what it is, is we are getting great support from the school when it comes to the social emotional, um, a lot of the other work that we need to do, but because she's meeting grade level, but we still haven't quite gotten the behavior where it needs to be, they aren't willing to work on the academics. And what we're noticing is when the academics is not challenged, she becomes bored and it leads back into the bad behaviors, if that makes sense. So we are trying to figure out how to get the school to focus on some of this. And so I just don't know if anybody has a recommendation on, we understand we can't have it all right now, you know, as we were just talking about, but starting that process so that we prepare her because I can just see those are very much challenges for her as we proceed forward. And Laura, so, I did put some questions in there um, in response to that. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you had an opportunity to look at that, but just me as a school social worker, um, I would immediately say, let's look at the social work minutes. How many minutes um, is your child receiving? Do we need to increase the minutes? Do I need to change where I'm providing the service? Um, that's why I asked the question, what related services does your child have? Because that's important because school social workers do focus on the executive functioning piece, the social emotional piece. Um, so it's always good to start there. I know if it, if it were me and I was in your, you know, I was your school social worker, I would be looking at maybe I need to change my minutes. Maybe I need to change my approach. We have talked about change in minutes and I've not been able to get the change in minutes just so we're clear on that. Um, and the minute she does get is usually with a group and that's part of the other conversation we've had. We have a child in that group that seems to derail that group. So she's not getting her direct minutes on a regular basis. 
And I do have a, you know, I've asked for a meeting and unfortunately I can't get anything before the end of the year, but I've got something in the first four or five weeks of next year. So I'm going to make sure we address that as quickly as possible, if that makes sense. But, and she does have a TA, a partner, a shared TA in her classroom that's partially assigned to her specifically for transitions. And we do have, um, we've got five IEP goals for her. One is around executive functioning, two around social work. Um, the other is completion of tasks. So, I mean, I've thought of everything I know to do. Um, and I will just say this, my school district is actually happy to have the educational advocates come in because sometimes they have some really unique ideas on how we can structure things a little bit differently or do it so it's less invasive in the classroom, if that makes sense, to make it easier for both her and for them. So, you know, I'm struggling with that next, that next phase for her. And I just didn't know if y'all had any recommendations. I, I'm going to answer at a much more general level, and I, and I I'm, I apologize. I don't want to in any way seem rude to anybody, but lawyers' ethics prevent me from giving legal advice to someone who's not a client. So I can't get into the weeds in my answers. Absolutely, um, it's not allowed to do that. But um, so I'm going to answer uh, really two things that at a broad level. One is that uh, I, when there's a concern about social functioning. I think the answer of more minutes is, is appropriate. I think it's also useful to identify, are there other uh, trusted individuals as teachers, as go-to people in the school to supplement what the social worker can do? Uh, it may be that there needs to be some time that's in a resource room to help to practice some of those skills, to get additional support from the teacher. But, but I wanna raise something else and I'm not sure you were really asking this I think there was another question that sort of spoke to this, but it's always challenging when a kid is very smart to balance what do we need to do to remediate with the fact that they're very smart. And there's this gets into a whole different presentation, but Illinois actually has a law. It doesn't have the same teeth or detail that the special ed law does or 504 does, but Illinois schools are required to provide special accelerated services for kids who are bright or gifted in particular areas. And my experience is that oftentimes, and to me, I hope, I hope uh, I'm not offending, but you might, may have encountered this too. Sometimes the educators, it's like you have to pick either your kid's gifted and we'll help you with the gifted or your kid has a disability and we'll help you with the disability, but we're not willing to help you with both. And that's, that's not an institutional position. That's just a, a matter of the individual attitude of the teacher involved. And so it's, it's sometimes important to be clear, you do have a right to accommodations, even if you're also in an accelerated program. It's not an either or. And because you, gave, you know, made the point of your child gets bored and that can lead to behavior, uh, they may be entitled to accelerated programming. And you may wanna raise to the IEP team that keeping them intellectually challenged is part of what needs to be done to help them to develop more appropriate skills. So it's not, it, it's never just an either or that you get to be accelerated or you get to have a disability and you can't have both. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one more question from um, Mr. Camber. John, did you want? To hey, yes, yes I do. Uh, hey, Matt, this is actually in regards to a comment that you made earlier. Um, we had a similar situation in an IIP, uh, IIP program where we believe that the services rendered were not sufficient. But those conversations, normally they do not go much further because it's seven, eight of them sitting across from you and regardless what you say, it seems like the decision is not changed. And that's why eventually I had to go through, you know, Bluebird route. And now we are getting prepared maybe to have similar conversations. So let's say that I did not get result from that mediation meeting you mentioned, uh, then what will be my option? Because I believe that what was provided for him 
15 minutes, 20 minutes of OT or PT per week was definitely not enough. And now I feel like I will have a similar situation. So like, what's the remediation on that if I'm not getting the results in the meetings? Like, how can I document that my child will not improve with 20 minutes per week, but it needs to be more? You going, Matt? <laughs> or you want me? I don't know. Which you one? go. You go. I'll follow. Okay, um, John. I you. I think you said twenty minutes a week, and I don't know what what service um, that is that, that you're speaking to. But no, twenty minutes a week is is not sufficient. Um, and and that has that was my stance when I was with CPS for seven years. That's been my stance when I was in previous school districts as well. If we want to see progress, we have to dedicate the time to do that. Um, and twenty minutes, uh, I really don't know what that means. So I always say, tell parents to to look at the data. Data being whatever information the child is bringing home. So whatever you're seeing from the school in terms of the work, um, whatever you're seeing your child do, um, homework, class assignments, any of that, bring all of that in because that's considered data. And sometimes parents see data as like a test, a standardized test or some type of screener, but th that's not the case. Data is data, whatever it is. And so bring that to the school so that the team can discuss it. An IEP is a fluid document, which means that if you see progress is not being made with the established goals um, from January 2022, it is your right to come back to the table to say something's not right. These goals aren't working. The objectives don't align to what my child really needs. I think we need to revisit this. So it is not um, the end all be all the very first time you get that uh, the IEP. Um, it doesn't end there you can always come back to the table and have a conversation with your team okay, oh somebody's talking oh <laughs> you can always go back to the table and have a conversation with your team to say it's not working we need to revisit the the goals and objectives we need we need to revisit the accommodations and modifications because the goals and objectives is what's supposed to drive the placement, where we're going to deliver the services. The accommodations and modifications is what's supposed to help the child um, access the curriculum, um, access the learning environment, all of that. So that would be my recommendation. I'm so turning it over to you, Matt. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, so it's my understanding. So first, you know, document everything you have, whatever it is, homework or the assignments. And if you believe that the goals are not, you know, realistic, then ask for re-evaluation of those goals. That's what I understood. Yes, come back to the table. Have a conversation with the team. I, I, absolutely. Um, and I don't know if your child re receives social work services or speech services, but, but I also share with parents that the related service providers should be your best friends because they are the neutral party. They're supposed to be the neutral party in the school building advocating for not only the child, but for the parents' needs as well. So if you have a great relationship with uh, a related service provider on your team, definitely have the same conversation you're having here with us with one of them. And Tamia, when I request a meeting, is there a like time frame that how soon it should be accommodated? Because then I did this before and the meeting time I got was like months later. Oh no, Matt, because I'm turning that one over to you. No, there is a time frame, John. Everything is a time frame. Um, and not months later should have been the response. There's actually um you don't get an IEP meeting no matter what, but in general, there is a rule that any reasonable request for an IEP meeting has to be honored, and it should be honored within 14 days of when the request is made. Um, I, I, and, I, and I would just um, say a, a different form of what Tamiya said, and Tamiya, you're, you're terrific. I wish I had you as a, uh, the, the involved team member. And, and so to just, a different piece of that I would emphasize to kind of as we're moving towards closure to be on a positive is the more that you can have 
positive relationships with more of the staff, the better. The more that you can um, find people who will be willing to speak up for your child on the staff, the better. And it's, it's really important to try to work hard to build those relationships. Uh, educators are under a lot of pressure, under a lot of strain. They don't get a lot of positive feedback. And I think they appreciate it when parents are giving them recognition for what they're doing. And for better or worse, they're also a lot more likely to stand up for you if they feel like they're feeling the love from you. Um, so, so having those relationships is really important. There are things that you can do if, if things are not working to bring in advocates and lawyers. And sadly, that's sometimes necessary. That's how I make my living. Uh, you can also get outside evaluators to provide data. And that's another way that you can help to measure whether what information the school is responding to is being dealt with appropriately or not. And they will frequently make recommendations that uh, what Tavia was saying, you know, more minutes, different goals and so on. You want to, if you get an outside evaluator, you want to have them not just say something general like this kid needs an IEP. You want them to help give you very specific suggestions about what services are needed and how many minutes is it pull in or push in, uh, pull out or push in. Is it, is it in a small group or a uh, individual session and what are goals that should be worked on and so on. Uh, but you have a right to input into all of those things. Rick, do you want to add to anything on that from a parent's perspective? Um, I, you know, I viscerally felt when you were describing like sitting there as the parent across the table from the eight or nine professionals. Um, and my first thought was, I think that's when I would, I would start with the education advocate in the room. And then, uh, like Matt said, you know, if you need to move to the lawyer, um, you know, in our situation, we brought them in too soon and it kind of alarmed everyone. And, but in our case, we had people who were ready to do the work. Um, but, you know, I've also seen the difference in that those professionals on the other side of the table when they realize that you know what you're talking about and you have someone with you whose whole job is devoted to getting you what you are, your child is legally due. Um, and, and like Matt said, unfortunately, sometimes that's, that's the place that you find yourself and that's the time to use those resources. Yeah, let me, let me just add one comment to that. that that's, uh, schools make decisions for a whole lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes having an advocate or a lawyer there can help with the discussion and reaching a good result because it, uh, particularly sometimes the school has a lawyer too and it can help everybody to calm down and, and kind of put away some of the emotions so that you're focusing on the kid and what they need. But sometimes a school does what you want just because you brought an advocate or a lawyer and they just don't want the asshole of having a fight with you. And so I'm to be clear, and I think I've said this, so I hope everyone recognizes, I'm not advocating that people lawyer up fast. On the other hand, I don't really care if the school does what we want for the wrong reason, if they're giving the family what they want. And if they do it because they're scared of the lawyer, so be it. But the kid is still getting what the family is looking for. So sometimes you get to the point that you, you, you need that help and you can get the result you want, even though the school may not really believe in their hearts it's the right thing. But this is all about trying to work out problems. And the more that you can have a relationship that allows that, the better. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you guys want to do any closing statements or because we're our little bit over, but we are over. I would just say this. I put I dropped some links in the in, in the chat, but two things I want to say. If you are a parent of um, Chicago Public School, so that is your um, local education agency, um, the district did invest in parent advocates. So they added that as a part of Office of Diverse Learner Supports and Services, which means uh, if you're not getting what you want from the school or your district representative, they did add that as an entity. So parents have someone that they can speak to about their concerns. Um, and the second thing is Illinois State Board of Education has a, a process too, where if you feel like you need additional support or additional um, advocacy or representation at the meeting, you can request that um, through ISBE's uh, website for someone from the state to be present during the IEP meeting.
But to be clear, they're not there as an advocate. They're there as a facilitator. So they're not supposed to take sides one way or the other. No. Um, I don't know if we could answer this quickly, but one more question from you, Zara. Private IEP or private evaluator, vice versa? Is it honored by CPS? It took us three months to get IEP scheduled and the placement as a parent pointed out was not satisfactory. Hence, we joined BBD. Um, any recommendations or districts with better special programs? Any recommendations? I don't know if Brad or Tamia, you want to talk about that? <laughs> Maybe I'm just watching your face. See, <laughs> I was like, oh. I mean, um, for us in terms of evaluation, we uh, we found that both was best. Um, we were able to get outside evaluation faster, and um, if only because for as for us as parents. You know, I, I used to say, even back when Cooper was at Bluebird, I felt like I needed four different, P, you know, PhDs in all these different areas. And how could I possibly know all the things I needed to know? Um, so just having the outside evaluation gave me a little bit more confidence walking into these like back and forth conversations about what was needed and what wasn't. Um, and in our circumstance, the CPS still did their own evaluation. Oh. They, they built off of what they had. And then as a parent, it felt very reassuring to then see those things kind of align. I mean, almost just like having a second opinion. Um, and it gave the team at the school a bit of a running start, I think. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they told you this too, uh, Brett um, Uzar as well. When you come with those outside evaluations, the um, the, the team is supposed to, to let you know whether or not they're going to accept it fully, mm -hmm. partially, or not at all. So they, they definitely need to let you know what they are accepting. That's the very first thing. If you're coming in with um, a private IEP or um, a private evaluation, that is your right to know what they're going to accept. Thank you for answering that. Well, I think we we are done. I want to thank our panel. It was awesome and it was very informative. Thank you all the families for joining us. And we hope to see you next month for the next Beyond the Nest series. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. It was nice meeting you, Britt, Matt. <laughs> you too. Sure. Good night, everyone. Good night. Have a good night, Evie. Thank see you, Aiden. Yeah. Good seeing you. Good seeing you too.